There is not very much theatre to write about. I didn't really think, and I don't really think even now, that there are many good Kannada plays written. Welcome to The River Has No Fear of Memories, a series of conversations with Gidish Karnad. This podcast is brought to you by the Bangalore International Center, and my name is Arshia. We recorded these conversations with Gidish right before his death in June 2019. In these episodes, we have a chance to listen to Gidish's wide-ranging observations about his life and his work. Along with excerpts from his plays, we'll hear various people talk about his legacy as an artist and as a public intellectual. Actually, Kannada literature is not that old. Really, you go back to 1930s, 20s or 30s. Masti started writing in the 20s. You have nothing like Tagore in uh, writing the short stories in the 19th century. Very good short stories, a hundred years ago. Our short story writing all starts much later. And our great writers, like Shivram Karan and others, mm. uh, 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 they all emerged in the 30s and 40s, influenced by Gandhi, very strongly influenced by him, reacting to Gandhi, uh, uh, to independence and, and reacting to each other is also. So, in a sense, they knew about each other's work. We have a, a, a novelist called um, who taught Kannadigas how to read. The real popular novel he wrote, not Tarasio, but uh, Anakru. You know, he, he wrote about society and lifting and of course, implicitly right-wing somewhere, but uh, all about uh, reforming society. And he also wrote about the state of women and wrote books on the horrible state of prostitutes. We must clean up the prostitutes and so on. And uh, Shivram Karan said that, you know, many of our writers went into the prostitute court in corners to clean up and they never came back again. <laughs> And he said that at a literary conference. I don't know now, you know more than I do, how much interaction is there. But I have a suspicion that somehow there isn't enough being written. You know, there, there isn't enough. One of the reasons why Bhairappa continues to be a great writer is because there's no rival. Even in his last days, I mean, we recorded this conversation with Girish three days before he died. Girish was thinking not about himself, but about the larger landscape of Kannada literature. I want to pick up on what Girish says here about Kannada literature just before independence, how it was mostly didactic and reformist. What do you think, Vivek? The Girish's comment about the literature pre navya is not uh, entirely agreeable. For example, Kuempu and Karanth and even Bendre, they were uh, wonderful writers and I don't think we can slot them in, in any of this. Uh, even Sriranga, uh, for that matter. Of course, Sriranga was very uh, progressive and he had this kind of a reformist view, but then you can't really slot him uh, that way. And I really don't know what Girish had in mind when he said this, but when you look at uh, these important writers, I don't think we can uh, say these things uh, about pre navya period. I'm not saying there were no writers who were reformist or didactic or who were, you know, weak. But if you look back and take the best examples in that period and or from, from those decades, I don't think that statement is uh, entirely true. Girish's generation of writers, they took Kannada literature in a different direction. They focused on the individual. But they didn't just change the content, 
They also experimented with new forms. People were constantly trying new things. You see, there were three centers of publication. Three or four, you would say. One was Mysore, where people like Anant Murthy were very active and, and they published and so on. The other one was Dharwa. Okay. And the third one was somewhere in, around, you know, Ariga, you know, South Canada, Malnadu, this kind of thing. So if you look at this powers of uh, creativity, you had Kuempo on one side, Bendri on one side, Adiga on the one side. And the, all three. And the real Navya movement really came with Adiga. And people like uh, Anant Murthy who were attracted to him. You see, uh, Bendri's uh, Navya was really Navya coming from Marathi influence. You know, he was not Navya at all, in fact. He didn't accept the definition of Navya. You know. But I was in Darwar, you know, and um, how shall I put it? They didn't like, uh, um, uh, there were rivalries between these three centers. You know, Kuwempur was not liked by Dharwar. So I belonged to the Dharwar camp. So I didn't accept myself as a Navya. So there were these three literary centers and there seemed to be rivalries, which we can talk about later. But Vivek, could you tell us a little more about these centers? See, one is Dharwad, as he said, yeah. and which is uh, Bendra-centric. And the other one is uh, Mysore, which was uh, Kuwempo. And then there is Adiga, which is, again, another powerful poet. So these were the three centers and there was always discussion, rivalry uh, between this, who is greater among, you know, these three. And I think it was quite uh, healthy. It looks like, at least uh, for me, uh, may not be actually to live that period. But the point I'm making is that the three centers, they had believed in different ways of seeing literature. Kuempu and uh, Bendre were, you know, pre navya uh, while Adiga was really the one who uh, steered and, and led Navya movement not only through his poetry, but also through his literary magazine. He edited a magazine called Sakshi, which uh, published many writers, including Lankesh and Anant Murthy. It's also interesting that Girish insists that he wasn't a part of the Navya movement, which was so attractive to his generation of writers. And it's also tempting to read his writing as Navya. Vivek, how would you define Navya? It is difficult to define uh, Navya. Many people say it was uh, it was similar to or in response to the the modern modernism in in Europe. I don't think so because they are they are two the political and cultural contexts are are different. After the independence, it was the first time that the people realized you know we are responsible for our own acts. And then there was suddenly uh, no restrictions were there in terms of thinking, in terms of dreaming. So I think all those things were reflected. So that I think is, is uh, first. The second thing is the period slightly prior to that was dominated by a kind of uh, slightly sentimental stuff and, and more emphasis on, on social changes. Because that time was like that, the society was like that, and literature was seen uh, as one of the things which must perform this duty. You know, that, is, that was the understanding and perception of the educated people. But then later on, it so happened that the entire Navya, the best of the writers, either they were students of English literature or they, were, they had gone abroad and earned a degree or a PhD or whatever. Whether it is Girish, Chandrasekhar Patil, Anant Murthy and Shantinath Desai. Lankesh was teaching English. So there was this knowledge and appreciation and exposure to uh, English literature and world literature, not just English. So they were naturally influenced by this. And like Adiga was greatly influenced by Eliot. So what influenced them is not really the themes, but the structure. So you can see that difference between Masti and the so-called the Navyas. I also feel that something was lost in this transition. See, there was, there was always a tradition of a storytelling. And that storytelling, there was a break here. And people started telling uh, stories in a different way, in a way that were written to read. 
Yeah. While in the previous generation, and there was, there is a lot of, you know, Karnataka has a very, I mean, like in any other state, there's a very rich folk uh, yeah. tradition of storytelling. Somehow that, uh, these writers never made use of it, yeah. except Kambar. But Girish also used the wealth of Kannada folk tales. Nagamandla opens with a beautiful story. When lamps in village households are extinguished, the flames gather in deserted places to gossip. Let's listen to an excerpt from the first scene of Nagamandla. Iravati Karnik and Lekha Naidu are the flames who gather in an abandoned temple late at night. Malika Prasad is a story who's just escaped from a man who kept her bottled up. And Vivek Madan is the cursed playwright who hasn't written a good play in a long time. Come on, why are you so despondent? We are here and are free the whole night. We listen to you. Thank you, my dears. It is kind of you. But what is the point of your listening to a story? You can't pass it on. Oh, no, that's, that's true. true. What, 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 can, what can we do? Wish, Wish we, we could help. help. I'll listen to you. Who are you? Let me go. What does it matter who I am? I'll listen to you. Isn't that enough? I promise you, I'll listen all night. You will? Yes. Good. Then let me go. Uh -uh. I need my hands to act out the parts. <sighs> there is a condition, however. What? You can't just listen to the story and leave it at that. You must tell it again to someone else. Uh, that I certainly shall, if I live. But first I must be alive to... Oh, that reminds me. I have a condition too. Yes? I must not doze off during the tale. If I do... I die. All your telling will be wasted. <laughs> As a self-respecting story, that is the least I can promise. All right then. Start. But no. No, 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 no. It's not possible. I, I, I take back my word. I can't repeat the story. And why not? I have just now taken a vow not to have anything to do with themes, plots or acting. If I live... I don't want to risk any more curses from the audience. Hmm. Goodbye then. We must be going. No, wait. Don't go. Wait. Please. I suppose I have no choice. So now you know why this play is being done. I have no choice. Bear with me, please. As you can see, it is a matter of life and death for me. Musicians, please. The story and the song. Begin. Nagamandla is part of this eclectic culture of reading and thinking. I mean, something like Nagamandla is possible because in Canada, there was already a vibrant culture of literary criticism. And it isn't just Adiga and his magazine Sakshi. In Dharwad, there was Kirtinath Kurtkoti, who was working for Manohar Granthamala, who published all of Girish's works. See, uh, Kirtinath Kurtkoti played a very important role in Girish's uh, life and writing. His response to Yayati is what brought him back from England to India. And Girish has written about it in detail. But I think what is more important is the way he edited his first play, which is Yayati. Kurtkoti wrote a foreword to Yayati. It in detail explains what is Girish's strength as a playwright. It also says what is his weakness in that particular play. And if you take that forward, you can just put that template on Girish's rest of the plays and then see where he has succeeded and where he has not succeeded. And I feel that for any writer to find a critique who can tell you what is working beneath your process, is one must be very lucky to find someone. And I think Grish found a critic in Kirti and, and that, I think, uh, has probably impacted the uh, rest of his writing. In Manvantara, you know, Kirti started writing about Sanskrit plays. You know, he, he yeah, wrote. Yeah. And that inspired. 
in the articles he wrote on Shakuntal for it, to take actually a Sanskrit play and write about it as a, it was a modern play, you know, and uh, treat it as a contemporary work of art. This is easy, as you know, because the technology of, of criticism in those days that uh, was very popular was new criticism. You, know, you took the play and you criticize it. It didn't matter which generation when it was written. You just treated this as a work of art. To me. And uh, 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 Kirti did that with Sanskrit plays. That was brilliant. You know, that excited me. I said, it's marvelous. I mean, yeah. This new criticism, it really liberated Girish to use old stories to address contemporary concerns. Tale Danda, the play Girish wrote after Nagamandla, it's about a cataclysmic 12th century event in the Kannada region, but it throws light on caste and religious divisions in India at the end of the 20th century. Similarly, he has written on Murchakatika because, you know, he liked it so much he made Utsa. Mm. There are a few uh, essays like this and I wish he had written more. I'm not surprised that he was a great critic. Because, you know, he's so honest, but he's also so sharp and so well-read. The honesty is, of course, uh, was there. But his critical essays, for example, the one on Kakanakote of uh, Masti that he has written, is one of the top-rated critical essays. It was included in a book of uh, 100 Years of Canada Criticism. He had wonderful insights into how uh, the scenes were structured, and how, uh, you know, the Natakriya is at the center of that play. And the reason why I wanted him to write more is to understand his craft more. If you look at the creative writers who have written criticism, in a way they are subtly communicating what is important to them and how the others must look at their craft. When you say something is good or bad or this is great, it also means that what you, uh, uh, it's what is what you consider, you know. So it gives a lot of insight into one's craft. Till this, you know, collection of essays came out in, in some form, people had very little insight into his craft. That's such a great insight, Vivek, because when you're a writer and a critic, you really are saying what is meaningful to you. You asked Girish why he didn't write more criticism. So maybe there was so much which was happening and the response that we were getting from outside. And then was it something... Well, there were not many plays with which I empathized for a start. You know, Kannada plays. The only playwright whom one sort of admired was Srinanda. Okay, he, he wrote. Yeah. He was serious. There is a, a playwright called Samsa who's admired, who's not a playwright at all. You can ignore him. Then there was Kailasam, who was a stand-up comedian, essentially. He never wrote him. And Sri Ranga. And Sri Ranga's generation, like in Marathi and so on, who was, right, was very much influenced in Marathi. This was really essentially meant plays. Was, there was a sofa in the center, chairs on either side. People came, sat and argued. So really their main part was to criticize, criticize society because it went, they were all congressmen and it went with their uh, uh, notion that um, Hindu society needs to be Harijan There are protests in Karnataka. Protests in Karnataka, Karnataka and yeah. the play, you know, they said should be banned and so on and so on. And that time, Manohar Granthamala started this magazine called, journal called Manuantara, you know, edited by this brilliant uh, Kirtinath Kutkuti. And he, they asked me to write uh, at Oxford and so on. You know, I didn't find very good uh, models to write on, but I uh, read a lot. You know, when, when I was there. I read on, uh, on look back and anger, what is the, the modernity, what Ibsen brought, and so on, so on, so on. And I used that to criticize Kakan Kote and um, Arijanwar. Arijan but the point is that I didn't, there were not many plays in Kannada that attracted me. You know, in fact, very often most of the plays were pinched from English and adapted, as happened with G.B. Joshi's uh, Satara Nero. Kakan Kote was, a, was something that excited me. 
I think even Masti Venkatesh Anger, who is essentially a novelist, was was taken aback. I also wrote of Hari Janwar, yeah. but I was so embarrassed by criticizing oh, oh, <laughs> that in the second half, I say, first half is how I don't agree with the play. In the second half of the same article, I say, but you can see it as a vision. And uh, <laughs> you, you remember, yeah. you can see it as a, a visionary play and praise him. You know, because I didn't want to, he was a senior. Uh, the rest of the playwrights in Kannada, Parvatavani and so on, they were all. So, there was not very much theatre to write about. I didn't really think, and I don't really think even now, that there are many good Kannada plays written. But of course, critical writing is only significant when you have critical readers. And the 50s and 60s in Karnataka is marked not just by an efflorescence of writers and critics, but also a profusion of readers. And this, in large part, is due to publishers like Manohar Granthamala. Manohar Granthamala is one of the most important institutions uh, in Karnataka. It is over 85, 90 years uh, old now. It brought together readers of similar taste. And G.B. Joshi traveled all over Karnataka to get his subscribers. But they also did a lot of other activities. Their office in Dharwad, what is called Atta, every day uh, writers met there. Every day. Either if you are visiting Dharwad or if you are living in Dharwad, writers like Bendre, Kurtkoti, Girish, whenever they visited, they visited uh, uh, Granthamala Atta. Even when I stayed in um, Dharwad for three months, uh, when I was 17, 18 year old, I would go and sit there because you will always find 15, 20 people sitting and discussing literature there. So it was that kind of, that kind of space. There was a system of publication in 19th century uh, Maharashtra and it was called subscription movement where you became a subscriber to a publisher and the publisher said to you, I will give you 500 pages of literature today and you pay me 60 rupees or whatever it is. And through the year, the publisher would choose, pick and choose literature and send you up to 500 pages. Whatever. So it was like a magazine working. There must have been British uh, models to it. But this was very successful in Maharashtra. You know, Chanda, uh, yes. And this was adopted by Manohar Ben Pamada. You know? And, um, but nowhere else in Karnataka. In, as a result, what it meant was the publisher took all the risk, picked up a book. If you decided to publish it, that's it. You didn't need any other money source. And, and the publisher's copies were sold right at the beginning. And money, as you know, in those days, people didn't publish for money. They published for fame. And because they wanted to oh, serve Karnataka and all that sort of thing. So that system worked. And therefore, Manohar Samala could publish all kinds of stuff. Can you imagine publishing Samskara with that erotic passage in it? Because, you know, all these books were read in families. They were really essentially re essential reading for the women in the house, you know, who cooked all day and stuff. And they, they read these books. So any kind of erotic, this created a, a huge rumpus. You're spoiling our women. The amount of rumpus that uh, they say. Shantana this. Shantana this. A completely innocuous novel, but it created yeah. such a huge thing. Because it, it talked about a girl menstruating, her you know, brother being interested in watching, all that kind of stuff. So, even the, so that Manohar Gandhavala created that, it was acknowledged by YMK here, an editor, that Manohar Gandhavala taught Kannadigas to read. But perhaps it's this really active literary culture that resulted in so many Kannada writers getting the Nyanapit Award. I mean, across genres, poets, playwrights, novelists, short story writers. One of them is wrong. 
I personally don't think Gukak should have got it. Yeah. Adiga should have got it. This is uh, well, one of those things that happened. Do you agree, Vivek? I think I share uh, his view. Uh, Adiga was certainly a much greater poet. I don't mean to say Gokak did not deserve it. I mean, it's like Adiga should have got, you know, ahead of him. One of the reasons maybe that so many of the writers were professors and they wrote about each other. You know, this someone to, to, you see, for instance, I was talking to Bhaskaran. This is interesting even. Now, he was telling me, everybody knows about what happened in Marathi theatre. Everybody knows what happened in Kannada theatre. But no one knows what happened in Telugu theatre, in the 30s and so on. But it's the most political theatre. You know, the Telugu plays against the British, bring, uh, plays about Gandhi, about Nehru, 20s, 30s and so on. People going to prison. We say we have no political theatre, but this is not true. Andhra has the most volatile, but unfortunately, they were not college professors. They wrote plays, you know, they, they were professional people and they didn't write about each other and therefore there's no record. People don't know. Even we in Karnataka don't know what, what got it. And that, that I think was our advantage. The main thing is the most volatile uh, literature really when modernism came where I suppose Bengali, Marathi, Hindi and Urdu, you know. Karnataka got it in North Karnataka via Marathi, but many people went to Shantini Ketan. I mentioned yesterday that one of our critics mentions that founding father of Kannada literature was called Bankim Chandra Chatterjee. So, <laughs> There is a story about Girish arguing with his Marathi writer friend, where his Marathi friend says that there is, a, we believe that there is not enough justice being done to Marathi writers because we have only, you know, two or three done pit and you guys have got, you know, seven, eight. So Girish says, yes, we also feel just it is, justice is not done because we have got only eight, we should have got 14. <laughs> So I, I agree with him because there were like Putina, yeah. was such a great writer. Yeah. He was, uh, unfortunately, he didn't get. There are many stories around Nanpit like this. Kannadikas are so proud of their Nyarapits. How did Girish react to winning the award? Girish is uh, probably the only writer who did not allow to be felicitated for getting this uh, award while all others have uh, done it. And it is, it is, I'm not saying right or wrong, but I'm just saying that that was how he looked at that uh, award. Mm -hmm. So I, I find it uh, something which is special. He, he also did not like him to be, you know, mentioned as Dan Peter Awardee yeah. and this, that. So he, he says, fine, award is something that, you know, one gets, but, you know, it is more important to focus on, on writer's work. I can see how this would play into the perception that Girish was arrogant. Obviously, it must have rankled many people. And there were already so many rivalries. You have a good story about these rivalries, Vivek, from a gentler time. There were stories that Adiga said, if Kuempu is a poet, then I'm not a poet. <laughs> you know, but he never said it. He, of course, had a lot of respect, but these are the stories which were all floating around, you know, in, in, in those days. In fact, there was a meet, I know, in Dharwad, where many of uh, the contemporary writers of that time, including Anat Murthy, went and spent three days and they had a kind of a, a literary meet. There is a beautiful picture of Karnad, Anat Murthy, everybody standing there. And they all stayed in, in some friend's house, this, that, you know, some 25 of them met and discussed for three days. The environment was like, see, all of them were uh, contributing to Navya, but then they were contributing for different reasons, <laughs> right? They were fiercely arguing and debating and fighting, but not, uh, you know, not vicious. Maybe at the back of their mind, this uh, 1956 was also there. Because you are now, you know, one, one community. It is like, you know, within the house. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is not, uh, uh, you know, it's not beyond. But I think I said it 
lightly but they were i think if you look at the debates and uh, see it was not just a oral debate they wrote on each other so evidence is there today to see and if you look at those arguments and those uh, essays one can see the mature minds working and responding to each other yeah. and this darwad people were telling me we we were going to organize one more thing so you uh, be the person to you know get people together but i said look now people hate they hate <laughs> <laughs> there is no <laughs> there is no friendship <laughs> but girish could appear to be a fierce fighter which upset many people one incident that i that i recall which i think it's in his memoir or he told me i can't remember now that once he had a very fierce fight with uh, someone in the evening you know they really fought bitterly and the next morning girish was uh, talking to that person very normally and the person was surprised and asked him how can you be uh, so normal after uh, fighting with me so fiercely that was satyadev dubey's style also mm. yeah. tum delhi walon ko kya aata hai natak kya natak hai chalo get out natak karte hain natak and and so on, you know ek ya kya tere se to dusre i baba shau teacher got drunk mad next morning chai ka hai bhaiya there is something uh, more than what we see in this story it says so much about how girish looked at certain things when it came to differences that art was for him as much outside as it was inside him you know the involvement with art at the time of creation was intense and he put his own self into it but once it is out he was able to look at it as if it is written by someone else and only because of that this objectivity was possible this fierce fighting was possible and it was still possible for him to be friendly with people and be normal so i think that is something which uh, was i would say an extraordinary quality of uh, girish which i myself have experienced You know when you talk about Girish and his early years as a playwright you can't not mention B.V. Karan his collaborator in theatre and in films so often Girish says how much he learned from Karan it really was one of the great collaborations of that generation you know maybe because Karan's approach was so different from Girish's what really made Kannada theatre well Brent really was the genius of Kambar not Kambar Karan you know he took all kinds of people he didn't fight with anyone give music you know root music so anyone he can turn into a playwright it did girish karnad and bb karant together have contributed significantly to indian theater so what he imagined as a playwright was realized by karant so which is why that combination is very important because it is very much possible that a playwright visualizes many things but if he does not find a match or an equal creative person to realize it on stage then then it's probably you know largely it goes waste but fortunately for girish and fortunately for karant and fortunately for indian theater that this happened and which is why uh, hayavadana was a great success if you look at kannada theater since then you can see karan's impact even today the way he brought in music the way he brought in dance and the physical movements but nobody has gone beyond karnad because there are two things which karnad excelled in one is that his technique his uh, ability to construct a play where not a single word is you can remove you know that kind of structure is something that is uh, not uh, easy to uh, imitate and uh, not even imitate to even aspire for because uh, i can confidently say that you know, no one no playwright of that talent has come into kannada theater since karnad and anyone who has tried to imitate using mythology or ramayana or mahabharata stories is a pale imitation so because of that uh, talent of karnad so it has not happened so which is why i said there is no uh, legacy of uh, karnad well as girish himself says he never wanted to repeat himself he tried to do something different with each play but i think it's more than that i think it's really that he wasn't afraid of any theme or any situation i mean he picks on three critical moments in kannada history 
Dalai Danda is about the Sharana movement in the 12th century. Crossing to Dalikota pinpoints the end of the Vijayanagara Empire and the 16th century. And Dreams of Tipu Sultan looks at Tipu's death in the late 18th century. Here's an excerpt from Talai Danda. Vivek Madan reads the part of King Bijala and Sachin Gurjale reads Basavanna. Your Majesty, a Sharana called Madhuvarasa has offered his daughter in marriage to the son of another Sharana called Haralaya. I saw no reason to interfere, and I didn't. Of course you didn't. How could you? After all these years of condemning the caste system, you could hardly oppose an inter-caste marriage now. It's perfectly understandable. You just held your hand back. The blessing was not completed. The wedding was called off. Correct? I am not in charge of this wedding, sir. I only hope the wedding's off. That is all I have come to hear. It's not off as far as I know. Basavanna, this isn't you. Surely you aren't such an idiot. So, I can only presume that after 15 years of being led by you, your disciples are now refusing to do your bidding. I have no disciples, sir. <laughs> no one is obliged to take my advice. Well, then I shall have to do what you evidently can't. I shall forbid the match. Sir, but that… You know perfectly well the higher caste will not take this lying down. The wedding pandal will turn into a slaughterhouse. The streets of Kalyan will reek of human entrails. But who is being punished for whose crime? Are the birds to be penalized because snakes resent their ability to fly? This cursed wedding shall not take place. Do you understand? This is an order. I am not willing to discuss the matter any further. In that event, Your Majesty, I shall go to the palace right now and sit in the grounds there and keep on sitting till such time as the prohibition is withdrawn. Sit away. Sit away! And, and why go alone? Take your whole congregation with you for company. You think I give a damn? I shall not ask anyone to come with me, sir. But they may, on their own, decide to do so. What do you mean by that? Oh, of course. Of course. That is exactly what will happen, won't it? The entire herd of Sharanhas will follow you. A simple thing like the treasury brought tens of thousands of them out. Won't the palace bring out a hundred thousand? Oh, Pasavanna, you are a sly fox. 196,000 Sharanas. They only have to lay down their implements. And market after market in the city will close down. Streets will fall empty. Trade will collapse. The economy will suffer a setback. The question then is, will my citizens accept such losses on account of an absurd wedding? Will any jackass of a king agree to place himself willingly in such a mess? And would even the biggest fool in the kingdom have failed to anticipate these possibilities after serving for 16 years as the king's treasurer? But let me warn you, Basavanna. If you think I have ascended this throne merely to sit back and scratch my ass, you are in for a surprise. After 16 years, how little you know me. You and those Sharanas of yours. Just because the city of Kalyan has fallen into your hands, you think you can twist my arms behind my back and push me around with impunity? I am Bijala! Know that and be on your guard. If you insist on driving me to the limits of patience, I shall stamp you all out like a cushion full of bedbugs. Lankesh's Sankranti came in 1973 and Grisha's Taledanda came in 1990. I would say that Taledanda was in a way a response to Sankranti. In uh, Lankesh's foreword, he says that this is something, if this was not something that connected with my community, I would not have written this play. And Girish says in his foreword that this period is so important in the history of Karnataka that it is like a tooth which, has, which is aching. And the tongue goes to that uh, aching tooth again and again. 
And you can see that the difference in approach in these two plays. Rankesh's play is also equally complex, but it looks at it from the bottom uh, rung of the society. While Girish's play, it goes top down. So Girish's approach is in a way Marga, if you can say. And Lankesh is Desi. And if you want to understand that time, I think we need to put both these plays together uh, to understand what is the complexity of that time and what is the impact of Sharana movement and what does it mean to say, you know, or imagine the annihilation of caste at that time. So what you're saying is that we need both Desi and Marga to respond to caste. We need Lankesh's vision and we need Karnad's vision. So it makes sense that you ask Girish if he considered Lankesh his rival. The problem with Lankesh, I think, is small town. You know, for instance, you see his articles he wrote in front. No, 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 no. I'm writing something new. So, and it's invariably something imitative of look back in anger. He doesn't break out of it at all. And then he, in fact, he even uh, writes Murugagali uh, Pinta. You know, straight imitations. Lankesh was a Supreme short story writer, I think. And he, he, the Kannada he used, which he was marvelous, I enjoyed. I didn't much care for his plays. I always saw him as slightly imitative. But Vivek, you didn't give up. You kept prodding Girish to tell us who his rivals were. Who were, were, were there any in your mind? Uh, any competitors? In, the person I immediately saw as a rival was Kambar. Because of the language? Yeah. Because he was from North Karnataka, he was from the language, but only Jokmar Swami. Because then I thought, oh my God, he's only repeating himself. You know, it's what Ramanujan very often said to me, Girish, if you want to write first-rate writing, your rivals are not within the circle of Karnataka or India. You have to think of the world. Take them as your rivals. Just take that as your horizon and write for the best. And he, along with Shah, kept one, and of course, for some of the key things this way, kept that um, that horizon alive all the time. Because in Canada, what happens is you pick up a very beautiful poem, you translate it, and you find that it's already been pinched from English. Very often. You know? It would be nice to have someone to compete with. One competed uh, in effect with Badar Sarkar and uh, Mohan Rakesh and so on, but not with someone in Canada. You have been listening to The River Has No Fear of Memories, a series of conversations with Girish Karnad. We thank the Nilekani Philanthropies for supporting this series. Pallavi MD and Konarak Reddy for the original music, Gokul Abhishek, Gaurav Krishna, and the Bangalore Studio for sound recording and engineering. At the Bangalore International Center, our thanks to Lekha Naidu, Raghu Tenkaila, Saraswati MP, S. Sarvana Raj, Rajashekhar BN, Manas Sampat, and of course, V. Ravi Chandran. Ajay Krishnan, Sunil Shanbag, Vinod Ravindran, and Vivek Madan. Thank you for being there when we needed you. Thank you also, Vivek Shanbag and Shanta Gokhale. Our special thanks to the Karnad family. Anmol Tiku and myself, Arshia Satar, have put these episodes together from conversations that we had with Girish Karnad in June 2019. <laughs> Pina.